and welcome to Genealogy Garage. I'm Julie Huffman, the Genealogy Librarian at the Los Angeles Public Library. One second, let me fix this. Okay. Um, Genealogy Garage, thank you for your patience, is the Los Angeles Public Library's monthly genealogy program. So we try to focus on different areas of interest in the world of genealogy. We are co-sponsored by the Southern California Genealogical Society and the Genealogical Society of Hispanic America, the Southern California chapter. Genealogy Garage typically happens the third Saturday of each month, except for August and December. If there's anything you've been interested in learning about, just shoot me an email. Right here is my email address. I could also add you to my email list um, that I, I email everybody once a month to tell them what the next Genealogy Garage subject will be. So just send me an email if you want to hear about anything or if you want me to add you to my list. That is how we came about having this program today, is one of you wrote me um, saying you'd be interested in French Canadian genealogy. So thank you for that. And the system works because I was able to book something. Now next month, we have an advanced Armenian genealogy program plan. You may remember, one moment, you may remember last April, we had an introduction to Armenian genealogy uh, program. This is gonna take up where that left off. Um, in case you have missed any of our, well, not any, but most of our genealogy garages, we've saved the recording. And if you ever wanna see one that you've missed, including that basics of Armenian genealogy program, just go to YouTube and Google Genealogy Garage, hang on, I'm gonna bring it up, what I usually do. Genealogy Garage, Los Angeles Public Library as your keywords, and that'll bring up the genealogy garages that we have available to watch again. Um, one day they will reside on our website and that'll be in one easy to find area, but um, for now that's what I do. So a few announcements before we get started. Just a reminder, the 1950 census, federal census, federal United States census is gonna be available April 1st of this year. So just in a couple of weeks. Um, you'll find a, on April 1st, you're gonna find a um, link to it at the National Archives website. So here's the URL you'd go to on April 1st. And then um, you can start adding the 1950 census information to your tree. So that's really exciting. Also, um, I just heard about this yesterday and I was floored. Uh, New York has recently made its vital records available for the years 1855 to 1949 available for everybody for free. Let me show you where you go for that. Um, so just go to that website and uh, you can explore their vital records which are now available. So that is awesome for people who have New Yorkers in their past. I think we all have some New Yorkers in our past. <laughs> okay, so for day, today's session, there is a handout. You'll see a link to it in the description of this event on the Facebook and YouTube page um, at which you're currently watching this. You might have to click on the show more button in the description of the event in order to see the link. And I will also post the link to the chat boxes um, on the Facebook and YouTube pages after we get started. Um, please type any questions you might have for our presenters in the chat box of either the Facebook or YouTube page. And I will ask them the questions at the very end of the, the um, presentation. But as you're thinking about it, just put in your questions and I'll keep a note, keep note of what they are. This session is being recorded and will be available to watch after the fact. So don't worry about taking too many notes. Remember, you can always rewatch, pause, back up, fast forward, that sort of thing after this event. So today we are so fortunate to have experts from the American French Genealogical Society to help us learn about French Canadian and Quebec genealogy. So let me bring my, my new friends up and introduce them. 
Um, Annette Mimo Smith. Did I pronounce? <laughs> no, I didn't do it right. Did I? <laughs> okay. um, she is coming to us from Massachusetts, and Normand Deragan Deragan yes. is coming to us from Rhode Island today. And actually, they're only did you say eleven miles apart, even though you're in different states? <laughs> yeah. And um, Normand, the uh, the French, the American French Genealogical Society is also based in Rhode Island. Is that right? That's correct. Northern Rhode Island, the city of Woonsocket. And were you saying that you have some California members in your we, group? We do. Uh, as of yesterday, we have 41. We had a, we had a, pe a, a woman uh, signed up from San Francisco as a life member. That's fantastic. That happened yesterday. So we have 41 now. <laughs> All right. So, um, <laughs> Many people are watching from Southern California, but a lot of people mm. are watching from all over the place. So sure. um, if you have French Canadian ancestry, you're going to really get a lot out of this program. And um, Annette, are you starting first or is Norman? Norm is going to begin. Okay, yeah. Norm, I'm going to remove us from the picture and I'll bring up your PDF that appears to be up there. But Annette, I think you'll have to advance it maybe. Sure. Yeah, I don't have access to it now, yeah. so she'll have okay. it. I'll give you the high sign. We have to change. Okay, well, again, Julie, thank you so much for inviting us to be here uh, this morning, uh, this afternoon here, this morning for you, uh, to talk about the most popular French-Canadian research, genealogy research resources. But before we jump into those, I'd like to take just a couple of moments to give you a little bit of history about AFGS. And we've been around now for 44 years. We started in 1978. There's a slide there. And it, we started at a, a French-Canadian social club here in Rhode Island called La Foya. And they had over a couple of thousand members in the club. And one of the members, Henry LeBlanc, was very interested in genealogy. And so he talked to the board of directors and some other members expressed an interest too. And he convinced them to give them a, a little bit of seed money to buy a few books and maybe bring in some guest speakers to talk about French-Canadian genealogy. And that's what he did. And, uh, and, and it worked out fairly well. So, um, but the problem was we didn't have many books. And so he wanted to buy more and add to the collection. He realized early on that he was not going to be able to keep going back to the board of directors and asking them for money. So he decided to make this little genealogy club uh, a dues-paying organization so that he could raise the funds to buy more books. And so in January 1978, the American French Genealogical Society was born. And we still had our meetings at the, uh, at the, at the social club, the LaFoya La Club. The problem with that, though, is if you could go back one, uh, Annette. The problem with that is it was a club where they rented out the, the, the hall for weddings and banquets and that kind of thing. So if you look to the right there, you'll see everybody used banquet tables to do their research. It was kind of crowded. And if you look to the left, that was the full extent of our research library in uh, January 1978. So we didn't have much, but we started at uh, as a small but a, a very enthusiastic group. And we met on Tuesday nights only. Those cabinets were on wheels, so we had to close them up and, and roll them into the closet at the end of the night because they rented out the hall and so forth. So uh, we only opened on Tuesday nights, and the place was packed, as you can see. It was pretty pretty busy uh, uh, when uh, when we, we all, when we were open. So anyway, um, next slide, please. We stayed at the LaFoya Club till 1989, and we just had so many books that we had purchased over that time that we just didn't have room to stay there anymore. So one of the members was a member of the church, a left-hand picture in the upper left there. It was a first universalist church, and we rented space in the lower level of that church building. And we were there, and we are still there. But in the summer of 2007, the church said, we don't have enough members. We can't support the building anymore. We're going to close. We're going to sell the building, and you're going to have to move. Well, we didn't like that thought, to, to pack up a library room. is not just, you just don't throw them in the trunk of your car. It has to be done professionally. But we were had already begun raising money to buy a building because we were running out of space there, and we ended up buying this building. And on Thanksgiving weekend in 2007, we signed the closing and we bought that building and we are still there today. And uh, the problem with this building, it was built in 1924 
And so we have three entrances to the building and everyone has stairs going up or stairs going down or both. So in 2018, we received a grant from the state of Rhode Island to install an elevator in that building. And then the law in that low, that right hand picture, you see that little vestibule. You walk in there now and you can get into the elevator. And recently we also um, had our restrooms uh, renovated so that they are now all accessible. So the, this is a three story building, 19,000 square feet, and anybody can go anywhere in the building now. So we're, we're very pleased about that. Uh, when the society was formed in 1978, of course, we established a, a mission statement outlining our purpose and goals, and we continue dedicating uh, dedication to those goals even to this day. So I'm going to turn this over to Annette now. She'll briefly go over what we do and our purpose in life, and she's also going to show some of the resources, and she's going to explain some of the, uh, the, the, the genealogy resources that we're going to use in this presentation today. Annette? Thanks, Norm. This AFGS mission statement has been revised a number of times over the past 42 years, but it's still pretty much the same as it was in 1978. We collect, preserve, and publish cultural, genealogical, historical, and biographical information, and we've amassed a significant collection of reference materials for French Canadian research in our library. We also publish a quarterly journal for our members called Je me souviens, which translates to We Remember. Only the title is in French. The journal is in English. AFGS also publishes many of the repertoires in our collection, and they are available in our online store. One of the ways we preserve our French Canadian culture is by offering a bi-weekly Zoom chat called Parlez Francais, which where French speakers can meet to have conversations in French with others who want to keep their conversational French alive. This program is open to everyone at no charge. You don't have to be a member of AFGS to join in. So if you do speak French and you're interested in participating, just email us at info at afgs.org. We also have an excellent cookbook of French Canadian recipes that is very popular, especially around the holidays. While our library is located in Winsocket, Rhode Island, many of our resources are also online in our members only online library for our members who are unable to come to the library to do their research. We also have videos of our lectures by excellent speakers that are on demand in our online library. And we appreciate the opportunity to fulfill our mission to conduct educational programs by meeting with you today and hope you will enjoy and benefit from it. Our membership on this chart uh, shows you where our members are located. Each stack is a different state. We have members in nearly every state across the U.S., in Canada, and in Europe. And on, when I made this chart, we had 40 members. Now Norm tells us there are 41. We're expanding our online presence because our members are all over. So we have periodical Zoom chats with members in various areas across the country so they can get to know us and let us know what their interests and needs are. In addition, we have our public Facebook page titled, naturally, American French Genealogical Society. We have recently created a group collaborative collaborative community page. It's called American French Genealogical Society Community Page. And members of that group can collaborate on their research and learn from each other. You can request to become a member of this group. It's a closed group, but membership in AFGS is not required. 
our AFGS library resources have grown from those rolling cabinets we had back in 1978. We have an extensive collection of over 20,000 volumes of records, births, baptisms, marriages, deaths, and burials from many parishes in Eastern Canada, as well as other parts of Canada and the US. We believe that it's the largest collection of French Canadian genealogical resources available in the US. The Druin collection alone contains approximately 2.5 million marriage records covering the beginning of New France through 1935. <clears throat> and because AFGS owns the U.S. copyright for this Struan collection, we have recently added the collection to our members-only online library with an index that is searchable by the groom's name. And our volunteers are now working on the female Druin collection, which will have a searchable index by the bride's name. <clears throat> we also have in our collection 5,000 plus rolls of microfilm containing images of original records from Canada. And they are used to verify any information found in the repertoires. The information on these films is considered a primary resource. It's the original document. Our research department can provide copies of these microfilm records upon request. PRDH, and excuse my French pronunciation, stands for a program de research et demographie historique and is an online research that contains all of the province of Quebec's Catholic baptisms and burials, as well as all of Quebec's marriages for 1621 through 1849. It is 2.4 million records. It is maintained in, col in collaboration with the Dem Demography Department of the University of Montreal. Although it is classified as a secondary source, it is of unparalleled reliability in the field of genealogy. As a family search affiliate, we are able to obtain information and films from family search that are not available to the general public. And also we have an institutional uh, membership to American ancestors. Your library may also have one. It's an online repository for more than 1.4 billion searchable names from America and beyond. Although they are the New England Historical Genealogical Society, their resources go far beyond New England to provide expertise and research across America for family history. This site will lead you from the United States to your French Canadian ancestor. So first steps, I'll begin briefly with the basics. I'm sure many of you already know this. You start by reviewing a paper five generation chart. And when I'm researching, I use paper. I can put it in so my software later. I use paper. Um, you write your source citations on the back of the chart. On the chart, you begin with what you already know. You put in yourself, your father, mother, grandparents, great-grandparents. You will find information on dates and places for events such as births, marriages, and deaths. That's the basics. You get yourself to your French-Canadian research. To learn how to find your French-Canadian ancestors, we will concentrate on the resources you will consult and the particular information you should know in order to successfully and accurately trace your French Canadian ancestors 
all the way back to the early 1600s when they first arrived in New France. This paper chart, as I said, is the best tool for your research. Put yourself on line one, and we have this chart available in our handouts. Norm will go over the chart in more detail further on. All the males are entered on even numbered lines. All the females are entered on the odd numbered lines. The marriage is entered only on the male section. There's no need to duplicate this information in the women's section. Along the right side, you will see spaces for chart numbers. The person on this line will become number one on a new chart, and the number will help you to organize your charts. The new chart number will also be entered in the space on the bottom left of the sheet. I always use pencil to fill this out. The reason is obvious. So you found a French Canadian ancestor. Good for you. This is what you need to find out. I'm using he, but it can be she. Who is he? Where was he born? Who did he marry? When and where was he married? And prove it. Source citations. Where did you find the information? You have to write that down and then follow the direct line. Proof is important. When you find an ancestor, you need to record these important sources to prove your information is accurate. You should put your source citation on the back of the paper chart, referencing the person's number when you write it. Your citation should allow you to go back at any time in the future and find this record. List where you found the information. Online, put down the URL and the date that you uh, searched it. At a specific library, record the name and location of the library. Record the name and author of the book, the page where you found the information, the library file code from the spine. Was it personal papers? Who had them? What kind of document was it? A journal? A letter? Can you make a copy of it? A paper copy? Or scan it as a PDF or a JPEG file? A good citation will help you find this source again at a later date. Classify your sources. Primary which is an original record, secondary, transcribed information, or derivative. And Norm will go over these in more detail. Once you have thoroughly documented your ancestor, then you are ready to go back one more generation. As I mentioned, your genealogy research begins with recording your own information and goes backward from there, recording each generation. When you reach your French Canadian ancestors, these collections or repertoires will be your best resources and they're listed on our handout. Some of these repertoires contain only marriages. Others have births, baptisms, marriages, deaths, and burials. As you can see, each collection covers a different time period in Canada. Some of the resources will overlap at the beginning or end, and that's always great because you can compare the information if necessary. Please remember that these are all secondary sources meaning that someone transcribed this information from the original records. Errors such as typos and transposing dates were common occurrences. And if something doesn't make sense to you, try to find the original records to confirm your information. You can find original records on microfilm. They are usually in French and sometimes in Latin and are handwritten, but Google Translate can be helpful with this. 
Once you have translated a few, you see that the form or sentence structure remains the same for most of these records. Norm is going to review a chart, a completed chart, and show you the various anomalies you will find in French-Canadian research. All right, Annette, thank you very much. That was great, great information there. So uh, what we're going to use with this particular, um, I'm going to use the paper chart. I know that maybe it might be a little difficult to read, but I'm going to throw this a little bit with you because I can show you the entire five generations. I originally was going to use my computer program, but I think you'll be able to see this a little clearer with one slide as opposed to uh, you know, surfing around and creating reports in my genealogy program. I used these in the beginning because when I started to do this research, uh, we didn't have the internet yet. I mean, this is go we're going back to 1978, 79. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have computer programs. So everything was done on paper. And so I have two big three and a half inch binders, one for my mother and one for my father full of these five generation charts. Since then, of course, they've all been entered into, I use legacy for my particular program. There's a number of them out there, family tree maker and so forth. All right, so let's get started with the five generation chart. And as Annette said, you start with yourself there on that first line. You also, there's a space to note if you are married or you have a spouse, you can put him or hers or her name there. And I, and I actually did her genealogy later on. So, you know, my mom, my dad, and so on and so forth. And I, we go through the lines and I, all of the information I was able to fill in there based on my research. And, you know, I did this originally in pencil. And as Annette said, I had a rather large eraser and I, you know, I made changes all along the way till I felt comfortable with it. And then I went back and tried to find those primary or at least secondary sources to confirm what I had found. So when I got through to the fifth generation, I wanted to take, this is what I call my A chart. If you look at the bottom left-hand corner, I have an A there instead of a number. This is the basis of my entire genealogy research. Those 16 names in that far right corner are the, are the surnames that I'm going to use to find the rest of my research. And that's what I was able to do. So we're going to refer to another chart. It's up on that upper right hand corner, number one and number two, where you said Pierre de Reagan and Josette Lamoureux. And so if you go to the next chart, uh, Annette, you should be able to see them there. There you go. And there's Pierre and Josette Lamoureux. I'm gonna do Josette's chart later on, but I'm gonna complete this chart as much as I can, and I have done that. And again, if you look in the upper right-hand corner of the chart, you see Francois d'Aragon, Dit La France, and we'll talk about Dit names in a minute, and also um, Marie Guilmet. That's, that is the last ancestor in my, in my surname's line. And, and I'm going to show you how we couldn't find anything else about him. And we'll learn about that. Uh, so you're going to keep doing this and you go till you've run out of people. And it might be 50 charts. It might be 20 charts, depending on what you're using. I was fortunate that both my mom and dad were French Canadian. And so it was a little bit easier for me to do the research. And I didn't have to mix nationalities and try to find them that different way. And if those of you that are doing that, I know that that can be a bit of a challenge and you run into these brick walls where you get into the old country, so to speak, and you just can't find anybody because in Europe, especially with all the wars, records were destroyed. And in many cases, most of my people were farmers. So they weren't predominant. The records, they, nobody cared about them, really. <laughs> you know, So it was difficult to find uh, records for them. Once I got back to France, once I found that first generation, in most cases, that was the end of the line for me. Next slide, please. So there on the flip side, whoop, not that one. Go back one more, please. One more. Back. There we go. Those are the notes that I made on the back based on I put the number of the person and things that I found along the way, but I still had to go back and prove all of this information. Okay. But now uh, I want to go back and go back to the next slide, please. I want to talk about these dick names and what they mean. Uh, and... and there's a lot of them, and I, I guarantee you, if you're doing French-Canadian research, you're going to find dit or dit name. Female is dit, male is dit, and what they are. These people were also known by these names. Uh, we look at the top uh, bullet there. Most of the citizens in that time period 
were illiterate. They couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't sign their names. So those who were recording these vital statistics, well, they wrote the names early on the way they knew them back in France, or as they heard them, then they'd write them phonetically. And recorders of vital statistics who were not French speakers, and that's usually what happened when, they, when, these, when these immigrants ended up in the United States, uh, they, they, they just spelled them phonetically or changed them entirely because they didn't have a clue how to write them. Next slide, please. So colonists to New France wanted to differentiate their family from their siblings by taking a dip name that described either the locale to which they had relocated or, or, or the means. You know, it wasn't unusual for a family back in the day. They had large families, 15, 16, 17 kids in some cases. Not all of them survived because the medicine there wasn't what it is today. But it wasn't unusual to have, you know, 12 kids and three of them were named Pierre. Well, how do you distinguish one Pierre from the other Pierre? So many of them would take a dit name because of that, or it was given to them by their father or whatever. You know, for example, if you had a Pierre in the family who was a baker, then he might have a name of Pierre so-and-so, dit boulanger, because boulanger in French means baker. So they took it that way. Or in some cases, they would take a dit name to distinguish themselves uh, from, the, from the, the, who they were or uh, to honor the family or by taking the name of the town or village they came from in France. For example, uh, my, grand, my, maternal, uh, uh, my paternal grandmother, whose name was Malo, she had a dit name of Hayette. Now, I'm not sure where that came from, but it was there, and then it disappeared after a number of years. But, you know, the problem with changing the names like that is often you don't get, it makes it a little more difficult to find who you're looking for. Her name, last name, her maiden name was Malo. And incidentally, you, all, you should know, you probably all know that you never use the married name of the woman when you're, when you're noting her on a line, because otherwise you'd never be able to find her parents if you used the married name. But at any rate, her name was Malo, M-A-L-O. And it went through the line that way with the dip name interchanging. And then I hit a, dip, uh, a brick wall that I couldn't find any more Malos. And I couldn't figure out why because I wasn't back to France yet. Come to find out with a little more digging and being a detective, I found out the real name was Saint Malo. And they dropped the Saint. And the Saint Malo is where they actually came from in France. Now, once I found the Saint, I was able to go all the way back to France and uh, continue with my research. So um, it's interesting, but, you know, the, you, that you really have to pay attention to the spellings and you have to pay attention to these dip names because, as we're going to see in a moment, they interchange them and sometimes they drop their original name and go with the dip name and you have a trouble finding the original name to continue your line. So it's a, it's a challenge. I don't know if this is unique to French Canadian research, but it certainly can be a challenge if you're doing that. I just want you to make make you aware of that. And so it was important that I explain to you about these these dit names. Next slide, please. All right. So now let's get into primary sources, and I chose my grandfather Joseph. And one of the one of the documents I'm I'm looking at here is his death certificate. This is an original document from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the interesting thing about this, as he lived in Rhode Island, but he died in Boston. And I couldn't figure out why that would be the case. And later on, my father told me what the story was. He became quite ill. His wife, Clorinda, couldn't take care of him. So he went up to Boston to live with his sister. And if you see up here in this top line, it says Little Sisters of the Poor. This was a nursing home up in Boston. And apparently his sister had to put them there because he was quite ill. Now, the interesting thing about this is he died in 1932. And if you look at the date here, he died on November 28, 1932, at, in, this, in this nursing home, Little Sisters of the Poor. If you look down a little bit further, you see the cause of death was a cerebral hemorrhage. But look at the date that that, was, that, that happened, the 3rd of uh, May in 1932. So he had, he suffered this cerebral hemorrhage, and that probably was the cause of him ending up in Boston and passing away. Arterial sclerosis was a contributing factor to his death. But I have some other good information here that I did not know before. You look down further on that same column, you see W.P. McGuire. He was the doctor who pronounced him uh, deceased. He was the attending physician. 
I also see in the next line where he was buried, Notre Dame Cemetery in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, where he lived. And he was buried on the 30th of November in 1932, and he died on the 28th in Boston. So you have to wonder, did they actually have a funeral wake for him or anything, or did they just bury him? That's a mystery. I don't know the answer to that, but it seemed awfully soon to bury him. I don't know what the story was with that. I may never find out. Going over to the left-hand column, you see there's his wife, Clorinda, which we already know. But look at this. He was 65 years, 11 months, and was it, 25 days. If you go back, there's a shot that you can look at and find his exact date of death based on that information. The other thing I didn't know about him, and I find out here, his, his occupation was a machine shop helper. And he hadn't worked in that occupation for two and a half years, obviously because he was sick. And the last time he worked was May 1930. But that tells you something if you know a little bit about the history. In 1929, the stock market crashed. The Great Depression began, and most people were out of work. And that looks like what happened to him here, if you look at that. Going down a little bit more, I find his father's name, Napoleon. Okay, and we don't know the mother's name, but we're going to find that down the road. But we see the address where they lived. 112 Capitol Street in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Interestingly enough, and I didn't know this at the time, I lived exactly one block away from this address. And I grew up there and lived there, and I didn't realize that my grandparents were actually living a block away from me. They had passed before I was born, so I didn't know that information. I'm not sure. My father never told me. I don't know why. So there's an original record for Joseph, and I can copy this information and put it into my program. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to take the primary source from my, my maternal grandmother. Rose Leah Barassa was her maiden name. Boyce was her married name. And this is taken word for word translation from an original transcript of their, her baptism record. And the parish was St. Hippolyte in Watton in Quebec. In 1898, uh, 1908, when she was born and baptized, she was baptized on the 23rd of June, but she was born on the 17th of June, and I have her name here, and now I have her parents' name, Edward Barassa, and look at this, he's a farmer, so now there's some new information for me, he was a farmer, I didn't know that, and Marie Duran, his wife, my grandmother's mother, and they lived in that parish, and they say, interestingly, you see all the people who attended the baptism, father and all these people, the aunt, the mother, none of them could sign their name to the baptism record. This is signed by the priest who baptized her, but also in February of 1923, her or someone in the family rode up to Canada to get a copy of this baptism certificate in February of 1923. And the pastor certified that this was in accordance with the original record found in the parish archives. So he's, he's certifying that it was original, and he's got it, and his signature was on the, on the paper. So I'm considering this a primary source, even though it's not a, a primary record. It's certified by the person that, was, that baptized her and also by the pastor of the parish. Next slide, please. All right, so now I'm going to go back to Joseph again, and I want to find some secondary source information about him. So I went to the Blue Druin Marriage Books. And incidentally, there's another name to this collection of books. And you, the reason they call it the Blue Druin, because the cover of the books were blue. It's as simple as that. And with the Red Druin, same thing. But there's an official name, and it's in French, and you're going to see it in the handout uh, You know, when you take a look at that. That's the original official name of this publication. At any rate, now I'm going in, the, in, the, in this Blue Druin Marriage Book, and I'm trying to find my grandfather, Joseph. These little ditto marks here show all the, all the names on this page were Joseph's. So I'm scrolling down, scrolling down, and I find Clorinda Malo here. You can see it outlined in red. So there's his wife. There's Joseph. And I find some information now that I didn't know before. I found Napoleon, his father. And I found his mother, Marie Darche. And I found Clorinda. And I find her father, Basil. And I find her mother, M, M is always Marie. Everybody was Marie. Almost all the women had Marie in their name somewhere. This is Marie, I just lost, Desselle. Okay, so I, that's another generation I just found. 
And look, I go over to the right, and they were married in the town of St. Césaire on the 20th of November, 1899. So here's some information. In the beginning, I, had no, I didn't know this, and I didn't know these people, but now I do. So this is great. So now what do I want to do? I want to go find Napoleon and see if I can get to the fifth generation. Next slide, please. So I go to, I'm still in the Blue Druid books, and I'm going down to all the Napoleons, and here they are here. Look at the, the different derivatives of the name. Very common. They spelt it the way they thought it was, whoever was copying the, the documents. So I find Napoleon, and I find he's married to Marie Darche, and they added an S to her name. So see, there's a misspelling right there. I know she did not have an S in her name. So anyhow, that's just, again, for accuracy. So there's Marie Darche. And look at this, I found Pierre. And remember in the first chart I showed you, up in that upper right-hand corner, there's Pierre married to uh, Josette Lemereau. Well, there they are, right here. I found them again. And I can, you know, it's a secondary source, but I'm going to look for it, and I'm going to tell you how I found them in the primary source just a little bit here. But I found more information. There's Marie's, Darche's parents, Auguste and Sophrony Gibalou. And now I found out where they were married and when. They were married in the town, the Paris of St. Matthias on the 19th of September in 1864. All right, so this is great. Now I've completed the Dragon line uh, on that first chart. And, you know, so that, that, A, that A chart is getting filled up now. Next slide, please. So now I've gone all the way. We're not going to go through the whole line. We'll be here for a week and a half. We can't do that. But I wanted to go to our, to my first guy here, Francois. That was at the end of the of the number one chart, if you recall. So I'm looking at Francois here. Look at different spellings of the names again. But look at this. I don't see any parents for him. But I know that he married Marie Gilmet, and there she is. And I find her parents' name, Nicholas and Marie Sell. They only use the first name because you, if you don't see anything else, you know it's Nicholas Gilmet, right? Now look at this page donation uh, notation here, page 630. What does that mean? Well, this is the page in the Red Druin where you will find this marriage. And I'm going to look at that because this is part of my, my line, and I'm going to want to find out more about the Gilmets. But look at this. Now we don't know anything here. There's no place. We see 1697. But we don't know where they were married. Were they married in France? Were they married in where? We don't know. So I'm going to try to find that out. So I'm going to do some more researching and let's see. So now we're going to go to a different publication. And this publication, by the way, is in the Los Angeles Public Library. So that, that does exist in, in the library there. And this is by Rainy Jetty is the name who the guy who wrote this a dictionary. It's the genealogical dictionary of Quebec families. If you translate, there it is down there. And I know in this book, when I look at it, there's only two entries for the Darragon line. There's Darragon Dite La France. There we go with the dit names again. Very important that you see these because, you know, things change back and forth, as I mentioned. But again, he, ha he couldn't find his parents' name either. We don't know who they are. And this notation right here tells you why. In French, this is d'origine inconnue. That means origin unknown. They don't know where he came from. Nobody's been able to find that out. And so, I mean, we have to assume that he was married in France. He's from France. We have to, we're assuming that, but we have to try to prove it. We see that they were married about 1697. They don't have an exact date, but they have the 1697, which we saw on the previous slide. But look at this. Now we have a location of the marriage. It wasn't in France. It was in I.O. It means Island of Orleans. This is a small island off Quebec City. And he was there. Why? I don't know what he was doing there. We don't know. He, and there were, there were four parishes on that island. One of them is St. Jean. And so this parish is where they were married. And there's Marie Gilmet again. And there's her parents again. We saw in that previous slide. But what's this? S. Sepulcher. This is the date she was buried. She was buried on the 11th of June in 1726 in Montreal. Okay. And now we start to look at their 12 children. And we find the two girls. One of them was married on the island of Orleans. 
but everybody else was married in Montreal and were born in suburbs of Montreal. So they didn't stay on the island of Orleans. So let's go now and see. I see the next one here right underneath that's highlighted. Michelle, the firstborn male of this marriage. And he was born, and means born on the 10th of uh, May in 1704 in St. Laurent. Now, St. Laurent is a suburb of Montreal. Okay. And we could see that that's, and he, he was born in St. Laurent, but they trucked him over to Montreal the next day to be baptized. <laughs> so he was, he was born in St. Laurent, baptized in Montreal, and he married in 1724 to Margaret Bourdon. Marguerite Bourdon, okay? So we know that. We know a little bit about where they were married, but we don't know anything about Marguerite. We've got to find out where does she come from? Who are her parents? So what I'm going to do is go to the next uh, listing for Darragons in this dictionary. Next slide, please. And there we find Michelle. Michelle, and there we go with the dit name. They haven't dropped that yet, so that's still there. There's Francois and Marie, so we know this is the right guy. And he was married on the 19th of June in 1724. Now and we're in Longueuil. Longueuil is another suburb of Montreal. But wait a minute. What's this? What's this CTO 9 Telhandier? What's this all about? Well, Mr. Telhandier was a, was a royal notary. He was like the town clerk. All marriages, baptisms, sale of property, that kind of thing, any kind of a contract that was done had to be written to be legal, had to be written by a royal notary. And Mr. Telhandier handled the, the, the Montreal area, and he's the one who wrote all the contracts. So he wrote this contract on the 9th of June, but look at this. They didn't marry until the 19th. So what's going on with that? Well, this was, this was the civil authority. When he wrote the contract, and it was executed by both parties, Michelle and Marie, in the eyes of the civil authority, they were considered to be married. OK, but most of these people were Roman Catholic, so they had to be in, in order to, for it to be kosher, to be, uh, you know, legal. They had to be married by a priest. And there was the priest around till the 19th because they traveled around from village to town and all that. So a priest would come into town. He'd marry people. He'd baptize them. If there were any funerals, and things he'd do all of that. He'd oversee that. So they were married on the 19th of June in 1724 in Longueuil to Marguerite Bordeaux, who uh-oh, what's this? Who's this guy? Well, Vrev means widow. So Marguerite was married to Francois Provost, and he must have met a sad end. And so she ran into Michel, and she married him. So what's the story about this? Now we have to find out what happened. So did a little bit digging. Next slide, please. And I found the marriage of Michel uh, D'Aragon to Marguerite Bourdon Provost. And again, this is official translation, French to English, word for word, from the parish law, uh, Monsignor. Okay? And it's, it's a typical uh, announcement that you, that you would still find today. Talks about the bans of marriage announced in the church and all of this stuff on the dates. And without objection, uh, Michel D'Aragon uh, did la France, son of Francois D'Aragon. So there we go. There's another confirmation of Francois and we know now that Michel was 21 years old when he married. Marguerite Bourdon, the widow of deceased Francois Provost. But look at this. We hit the we hit pay dirt. The daughter of Jacques Bourdon and Marie Menard, both of them from that parish. Okay, so now we've gathered some more information here. And the undersigned Monsignor of the parish, he's he's certifying that in this parish he received verbal consent from them. Uh, for a nuptial blessing in the presence of the bridegroom's side. So this must have been the best man, Timothy Sylvain. And on the side, on, so he signed his name down here. He was able to write. But the bride's family, uh, Marie, Marguerite, all of these people that were there, they didn't sign. They didn't, they didn't know how to write. So they didn't sign the document. But the Monsignor certified that this is correct. So there were two signatures on this document. To me, that's good enough to be a primary source. Okay, I didn't take it out of a collection book or anything of that nature. But if I wanted to, if I didn't have this document, much like with my grandfather Joseph, what would I do? Next slide, please. I would go to the infamous Red Druin, because <laughs> it's red, and I find the uh, provost, I find the provost marriages here. 
And I scroll down, scroll down, and bingo, here's Francois married to Marguerite Bourdon. And incidentally, while I, before I forget, in the Bourdon family, there was a descendant that wrote a dictionary of all the Bourdons he could find. This collection, by the way, is in the Los Angeles Public Library, I noticed. There's 7,000 Bourdons in this book, and I have no doubt Marguerite is probably in there. But at any rate, if you want to look up Bourdons, you have a good, good chance of finding a lot of them in the Los Angeles Public Library now. But anyway, so now here's Jacques and Marie Menard that was in the same document we just read. So there's a further confirmation that this was her parents. And again, see that page notation. You're going to, you can find Jacques and Marie's marriage record on that page in the Red Druin. But then, once again, we have more information. They were married in Boucherville on the 27th of April in 1716. Okay, so that's good information. I'm going to want to note that first marriage by her. And I'm, I'm going to note Francois uh, and, and maybe his parents. But I don't, I mean, she was a nice guy, but I don't care about him because he's not part of the family line. So we're going to move on. Okay, so there's another good information uh, that uh, uh, we have about another line. But I want to go back here for just a moment. And I want to talk about Francois one more time. And I want to show you another derivative. If we could just go back a couple of slides on that to, Mich uh, to Francois, uh, one more, right there, okay? We don't know much about him. We, we're making a lot of assumptions. So I'm going to use the third source that Annette talked about, the derivative source, the supposition source, if you will, information that I was able to find out involving Francois de uh, la France, but I can't prove it. OK, and what I did is I came across a dictionary, a compilation of Darragon and La France uh, individuals. And this lady, Michelle Eber, wrote this book and she does all of the lines and Darragon and La France. And she wrote two volumes of all of these people. Interestingly enough, she did not. She mentions Francois, but she doesn't trace their lines. And the reason for that is she was really a La France. And at two or three generations into the 1800s, this family line broke off. And you had the La Frances and you had the Darragons. And I'm on the Darragon side and the other people went on the La France side. So this, this family has split over the years. But I found a, a, a citation that Michelle ever wrote in her publication that gives me a lot of answers about Francois and confirms what I supposed was the case with him. And I'm just going to read this from her citation, and you'll understand how we learn a little bit more about Francois. The first member of the La France family to arrive in North America was not named La France at all. He was Francois d'Aragon, and he was a member of King Louis XIV's Troupes de la Marine. He appears in a list of soldiers and a 1694 document from the Isle of Orleans near Quebec City. His later marriage record shows him to have been 37 years old in 1697, so he must have been born somewhere around 1660, somewhere in France. In the early 1700s, newly arrived soldiers in New France, which is now Quebec, were sometimes given the nickname Dite la France by their companions. This happened to settlers named Dubois and Pinel, for example, and it's also happened to Francois d'Aragon. The dit name persisted for several generations until the 1800s. At that time, Francois descendants became weary of this lengthy name. Some began to just call themselves La France, and the others used the name d'Aragon or some corruption of that name, such as d'Aragon with two R's or d'Aragon, D-E-R-A-G-O-N, which is my name today. But the question I ask, and the question she asks here, is why did Francois d'Aragon did La France move his family from Ile d'Orléans, Isle of Orleans, down the St. Lawrence River to Montreal Island? Well, here's the answer. At this time, Montreal was becoming the center of the fur trade in New France. In 1666, a census of Montreal showed about 900 inhabitants. By the year 1700, there are around 15,000 Europeans spread throughout the colony of New France, and 1,800 of these settlers lived in Montreal. This settlement needed to be defended to protect the profitability of the fur trade, and Francois d'Aragon must have been among the soldiers charged with that task. 
So there's the supposition. We can't prove it. Uh, there is a document that shows him that he's on a list of soldiers in 1694. And I've written to the to the history set, uh, organization on Island of Orleans trying to get a copy of this document so I can see his name on there. But, you know, he must have been on a ship. He was a soldier, uh, the troop that are Marine, and they must have been stationed on the Island of Orleans, perhaps to protect the inhabitants from raids or what have you. And when things got wild in Montreal, after he married Marie, we can suppose that his ship was restationed to Montreal and he was able to move there and he took Marie with him and he stayed in Montreal. He got out of the military at some point and had all of these children and Michelle and all of those people uh, that, that I'm descended from were all from the Montreal area. I've been able to prove that. So there you go. There's another indication of things that you can, that's a, that's the third source of information uh, that you can find, a supposition uh, that I, it certainly makes sense to me. I can't prove it, but based on what others have found and, and, and why he ended up from one island, which is really, when you look on the map and you look at Island of Orleans and you look where Montreal is, I mean, there was, you know, he, he would have gone there only by using the St. Lawrence River. And since he was a Marine, he was on this ship. My guess is that uh, it makes sense that he would have gone to Montreal because he was needed there. Next slide, please. Oh, good. Go a couple of more slides back. One more, one more, one more. All right. So in your handout, and I know this is very difficult to read, you'll have a, what we call a family group sheet. Now, if you're just starting to do your research, and frankly, it doesn't matter whether it's French Canadian or not, this sheet becomes very helpful because what the sheet is is one particular marriage in the line of chart that, in your charts that you have. For example, I use Joseph a lot here, my grandfather. So if I wanted to do his family, I could take his name and, and, and you know, the part it says the father, you write his name and it's all the information that you can fill in about him and his wife's name, Corinda, write all of that information. And now you list all of their children, when they were born, where they were born, if they married, what was the spouse's name, when did they marry, and when did they pass? And so at a snapshot, you have an entire family uh, that's right there, not the whole line, but one spe spe a specific family that you can take a look at uh, in a hurry. So that's it. Next slide, please. So uh, we're going to have we're going to answer your questions. Hopefully you'll have some questions for us uh, in a moment. There's our website. We invite you to look at that and, and uh, surf around in there. There's lots of good information on that site. There's our general email address, info at AFGS.org. So if there's something that we don't answer for you or you think of something, you know, while you're having dinner tonight or something and we didn't answer it for you, please feel free to send us an email. And it'll get passed on to the proper person who'll try to answer that question for you, and we'll get back to you. You can call us, 401-765-6141. Most likely you'll get email, uh, voicemail because we're not open seven days a week. But if you want to do that and leave a message, again, someone will get back to you. And Annette already mentioned our Facebook pages, uh, the, the uh, community page and the regular uh, site uh, society page. If you want to follow us on those pages, maybe there'll be some information that will come to you through other people doing research on French Canadians that might be useful to you. So with that, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting us today. I want to turn it over to Julie, who screened some of these questions, if they have any, and we'll see what we can do to answer your questions. Yeah. Um, well, we have one related to the pedigree charts okay. you showed earlier. Yeah. Um, I'll just bring Maggie's question up. Sure. She's basically just wondering how you show siblings on those pedigree that come, charts. That comes later. This is your primary first people in your lines. Once you get to as far as you can go, then you start to move yourself back. I have 12,200 names in my genealogy computer program. I didn't have that many chart you know five generation straight line charts this is just a direct line to the to the parentage if you will you know your grandparents your great grandparents your great great grandparents now once you get to you try to find their children and if like we like you saw in the in in um uh, francois d'aragon's line you see the 12 children michelle's 12 children well now you can record those in your charts when you get to him 
You know, you'll be able to record those. That's why I think overall, at some point in time, you'll want to have a program like a like a <coughs> legacy or family uh, tree maker because it's so much easier to keep track of all these people. It's very difficult. Yes, but that's how you all the uncles and aunts and siblings, those will come later. And, you, and it's, it's closer up to you are to where you are today. It's much easier to find. I mean, you probably know who your brothers and sisters are and your fathers, you know, your aunts and uncles. But when you get back four or five or six generations, you have to do some detective work to find them. But that's how you do it initially. You're just doing straight lines, straight across. If I want to record a particular family, I use my family chart mm -hmm. and I, um, I make a note on the top which number, which chart number... Good point. This family uh, belongs to. And then I use the family group sheet and I can list every child and who they married and when they were born, when they married, when they died. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing about that, too, Annette, and, uh, you know, for everybody else, you know, wh where do you draw the line? How If you want to go out and find every Mimo that ever lived, you know, you'll have thousands and thousands of names, you know. So at one point in time, I just said, you know, I, after about four or five generations of the kids, yeah. I just said, you know, let's 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 pull the plug on this. Tap the brakes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a lot of people. But, yeah. you know, some people do it. I mean, we have people in our library that have been researching for 30, 40 years looking for these children and, you know, find to find the stories about them. What were their occupations? Where did they go? Where did they move to? I'm sure some of them that moved to New England to work on the textile mills are living in California. Their descendants are living in California now, you know? Um, I don't see uh, any questions from the viewers at this point, but I have a couple of questions myself. Sure. Um, I was really glad you mentioned those dit names because mm. I ran into my first one uh -huh. uh, just like a month or two ago. And actually it was a prevost Oh, no kidding. Person. What a coincidence. <laughs> not, not my tree, but my friend. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, I my tree is on Ancestry.com. Sure. Okay. And um, how do you put a dit name? Do, do, you, do you put a dit name in? You know how you have first name, last name for the people on your tree? Yes. Do you include the dit name I at do. that level? Yes, I do. And what I do is I put them in parentheses. So I'll put the first name in parentheses, the dit name, and then I'll put the surname after that. Because I'm really going to try to search by the surname, unless they change their name completely and kept the dit name, then you have to evaluate how you want to deal with that. But I just put them in parentheses, or I'll just put them after the after the first name. So if I see two names, I know the one, some of them have three or four dit names in the family. Mm -hmm. I'll see those names, but the last name is the surname that I'm looking for. The ones in the middle of the dit names. That's how I do it. Did people ever change their dit name after they came up with one? Yes, it's, you see that quite fair. Like uh, you see the Hayet with my, I mentioned my maternal grandmother. Her name was Hayet. And uh, uh, my paternal grandmother, I mean, Joseph's wife, Melo. She had Hayet for a, for a dit name. But that, you know, that after a while, it, it disappeared. You know, mm -hmm. she wasn't known as Hayet. You know, I mean, she, she was always known by the Melo last name. So, right. you know, it, 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 it varies from family to family. And, and a lot of these dit names were dropped when they when they met the town clerk in the United States who just said, what's this dit name? Stuff? Yeah. Name is, and that was the end. They, that was the end of the dit name. <laughs> you know? it, it might be. I mean, it's it's actually a pretty dynamite way to get clues about maybe the family where they're from or yeah, a maiden yeah. name or something like exactly. that. Well, like I mentioned with my with uh, with, with my Clorinda Melo, she was from St. Malo. In, in France, next to Paris, you know, but uh, she they dropped the Saint, like the La France and the Durega, they, they got too long, so they just kept La France. So it's an individual choice, but it is confusing when you got to so find these people 300 years later, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, <laughs> I have Scandinavians, so ah. they have that pet, the patronymic system, so it's oh, a lot okay. of. Sven daughter and Sven son kind of thing within the same family and yeah 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 okay mm -hmm. um and then uh the person who actually wanted us to invite 
you here, um, was wondering about French notary records. Now, I yeah. don't have any experience with that, but could you maybe explain uh, the French notary records and how they might be used for genealogy, maybe what they are, if you know? Yes, yes. Well, as I mentioned, when I was talking about uh, uh, Marie Bourdon, Marguerite Bourdon, and we saw that, uh, uh, that uh, well, it was Michelle, actually, and it was a Tellier, the contract notary. These are people that were appointed by the king, by the, by the government, to make sure that they kept records of all the contract, land sales, and things of that nature. And that was his job to write those contracts, and people would have to go to that notary to get those contracts done to make it a legal transaction or a legal marriage or what have you. Now, those records are available. For example, you, you can go and look up Talhandier, and I can find, uh, and it, it's, they kept the, the Canadian archives, I can find all the contracts that he never written, and I can find out if my Francois d'Aragon ever bought a cow or bought land or sold land or what have you. Those contracts are still on file and they are available today. So if you want to find out if any of your French ancestors own farms, or were given farms or, you know, that sort of thing, farmland, um, then you could probably find it in the records there. They're still available. You have to, you can, you can search for them. If you want a copy, you have to pay a fee to the Canadian government to get it. But we have books in our library of some of those folks, but we don't have all of them. And some of them, I think some of them are just an index. So you can find out if, you know, if, if you, you know, I realize that you can't, we may end up putting those on the members only site at some point. But, you know, some of our folks can go in and look up the notaries and see if any of their relatives actually had contracts that they could look up and try to get copies of them. OK. Um, and Annette, did you have a comment about the DIT names? Yes, I did. Um, when I run into DIT names, I record them. I record the last names in all capitals because uh, French names can be Jean-Pierre. Alphonse, de Reagan, La France. And of all those names, I like if you put all the last names in capital letters, you can spot right away that there are two last names. Hmm. Actually, and, that's what I do, Annette. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I do. Yeah. yeah. And we I just want to let you know that we have a list of deep names on our website. Oh, on yeah. our, on our main website, main web if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you will see um, a link that says surname variations. Well, that's another description of a deet name, a surname variation. So if you click on that, you can download an Excel spreadsheet that has 18,000 deet names on it. On our members only website, we have a list of 35,000 deep names. But this list of 18,000 will give you some good information. For instance, if someone named LeBlanc came from Canada to the US, they would change their name to White because LeBlanc is white in French. So there's white, there's, uh, my grandmother was an O'Coin, which translates to wedge. So she was an O'Coin when she came here. And then on the 1880 census, their last name is suddenly wedge because that's what it meant in French. So they tried to become American in various ways. Um, Palmenville became Appleton. Um, so, the, you know, a rose is a rose. And there are plenty of names for them. Yeah. Well, you know, that's right. Boisvert, Greenwood, Boisvert, Boisvert became Greenwood. And yeah. The problem with that, of course, it's nice, it's, it looks nice on paper until he opened his mouth. And then you realize he really <laughs> wasn't Greenwood. <laughs> you know, <laughs> with a heavy, thick French accent. But yeah. Yeah. Well, and they, in, but they did assimilate. I mean, they really did try to assimilate into the culture. Yeah. You know? yeah. In the books, in these uh, repertoires that we have information, 
we have to remember here when we're researching in the U.S., we look for a birth certificate or a death certificate. Well, in Canada, uh, there was no reason really to record births and deaths. There was no social security. You didn't have to prove what day you were born to qualify at your 65th birthday. So, um, and they were all pretty much Roman Catholics, these French Canadians. And so what was important to them were the church sacraments. And so it's the church that kept all the records. Hmm. And when you search, you'll find a baptism as opposed to a birth. And the baptism record will probably say, most likely, that um, they were baptized on January 2nd, uh, the day they were born, or baptized on January 4th, two days after their birth. And so in the baptism record is where you find the birth date by calculation. And the same for the burial. You won't find a death certificate. You'll find a burial record, and it will say they were buried on the day they would they died or two days after they died. And if they were buried on the day they died, most likely it was from an illness and no one wanted to keep the body around in case mm. it, you know. So that's a clue, maybe the reason they died. You know, maybe there was some illness going around and they died and were buried on the same day. So- Or, um, or, or it was July when it was extremely warm yeah. <laughs> they didn't want to keep them, you know, for obvious reasons. Yeah. For health yeah. reasons really. and, in, and in the books, you'll see N and a date. N means knee, and that means when they were born. N is their birth. B is baptism. D is when they died. And S, as Norm mentioned, sepulcher, is when they were buried. So the religious records of the sacraments are the pathway to the birth and death information. I found um, church records from the Druin collection on Ancestry.com. And what was interesting was it, I don't have French Canadian ancestry, but I, I do have uh, native Canadian and apparently like Native Americans or Indians, mm -hmm. um, the Native Canadians were living under the French Canadians and um, possibly a reservation sort of system. And they were given sacraments, probably not their original religion. And But because of that, I found non-French Canadian people in the French Canadian Catholic Church records. So yes. that, was, that was kind of interesting. PRDH has an extensive uh, database of um, Native Native Americans. Yeah. I have a, a question from Dominic. Let me bring it up. Mm -hmm. What if you find multiple birth records of a descendant, say in New Hampshire, for example, and Canada? So how do you differentiate between multiple birth records? Well, that's very common. Again, you know, because they say, where were you born? And oh, I was born in St. Césaire, and they have no idea what that is. So they would just write Canada. If you look at census records, the same thing. They wouldn't put down where they came from in Canada. Um, as far as uh, finding multiple birth records of, of, one, of the one descendant, they would only have one birth record, I would think. Oh, am I not understanding the, the question? Maybe one of those records was not a birth record, but a baptism record. You know, um, the immigrants from uh, Canada went back and forth over the border quite a bit. It wasn't like they took a ship here. They could go back and forth frequently, and they did so. Sometimes they would have a baby in the U.S., and then they would go back to Canada for the christening with, to be with their other relatives. Okay, well, I'm not finding any other questions at the moment. So I think um, we might call a close to our day. And I just wanted to 
thank you to um, again and again for donating your time today and just being so generous with your information. And um, because this will be recorded, we'll be able to have it available for people to um, come back to or come to for the first time and learn about their French Canadian ancestry. And uh, I just want to, I know everybody's very grateful for your time today. So thanks. Thanks so much for coming. Oh, it's great, great to be here. Thank you for inviting us again, Julie. So hopefully we'll catch up with you again. All right. Good luck with your research. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Bye everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Bye.